you know, what's going on as far as that's concerned. So continue to keep them in prayer. All right, now I'll talk to you uh, about something that if the Bible is true, then uh, it's something that we need to guard against. And by no means is this message intended uh, to be accusatory unless you're guilty. <laughs> so if you feel, hey man, it's good to see you all. Chapers, good to be glad to have you here. Good to see everybody here. Let's see, Dustin, it's good to see you and Shelby Lou here. I'm glad you're here. Appreciate you being here. Oh, yes, good to see you too, Big and Isaiah. Glad you're here, sir. <laughs> he stood up like... <laughs> That's a walking miracle right there on the high ground. We got a lot of testimony. We could just have a testimony. We're not going to, but we could have a testimony service. Take your Bible and turn, if you will, to John chapter 6 will be where we're going to start. John chapter number 6. Be in a few places here, kind of try to put it in a little bit of a, uh, of a story for you to see if you can find yourself in the passage. In 1 Timothy now, he tells you uh, that he said uh, that in the last days uh, that there'll be many that give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and many shall depart from the faith. Now, that doesn't mean you have to depart, but it does mean that one of the things you want to check is you constantly is your fellowship with the Lord to make sure that everything's right. Remember in the book of Mark and then in another one of the Gospels there that um, the Apostle Peter, he stood up and you remember what he said uh, when the Lord's having the Last Supper there and so on and so forth. Uh, the Lord said, before we're done tonight, one of you is going to betray me. You remember that? And uh, Peter immediately, I mean, it's called the dog always yells first, but immediately Peter said immediately, Lord, though all others forsake thee, yet will not I. Do you remember that? And the Lord said, uh, Peter, you're going to be the one that's going to do it. And the Bible says, and Peter spoke the more vehemently and said, Lord, all these others might do that, but I will not do that. And he said, before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me thrice. And then Peter said, it's not going to happen. And he goes out there and goes to sleep underneath the tree. And sure enough, exactly what God said was going to happen. Even after he told him to watch and pray, he gave him several opportunities to get the thing fixed before it got broke. Now, what God does is He provides for us a Bible. He provides for us a church. He provides for us a preacher to be able to tell us some things. And when He warns us, we should give heed to the warning. We shouldn't look at it and go, well, it'll never happen to me. We should say, no, Lord, not, not, you know, Lord, it should be, is it I? I'm prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. You say, what? Well, all it takes is just an infinitesimally small thing, and then before long, we're where we said we'd never be. I mean, how many times have you heard somebody stand up, give a testimony, boy, the Lord's been good to me, and boy, sure has taken care of me. I sure do appreciate what God's done for me, and thank God for this church, and thank God for this Bible, and thank God for this preacher, and thank God for this, and then you can't find them with a halogen flashlight. What happened? Nothing that hasn't happened to everyone that's gathered here before, but there's some telltale signs, some things that you want to look out for. Here you have the Lord, He's getting ready to go out and He's starting His ministry here in John chapter number 6. And the Lord's more of a crowd thinner than He is a crowd pleaser. And when the Lord comes up there, after He gets through with everything, uh, He's uh, preaching to them there. And pick it up in verse number 60. John chapter 6, verse number 60. Many therefore of His disciples, when they had heard this, they said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And Jesus knew in Himself that His disciples, watch out, His disciples, the followers of Jesus, what? Can I just say this? Jesus knows it whether everybody else does or not. Does it bother you that Jesus knows you gripe? And that's another message. And He said unto them, does this offend you? What is the, uh, what and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where He was before? Is it a spiritual quickening? The flesh profiteth nothing. The words I speak unto you, their spirit and their life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray Him. And He said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given to him of my Father. From that time, many of His disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you go? Will you also go away? Brother Larry, you pray. Would you please and ask the Lord to help us out? Well, we'll bow our heads this morning and thank you for the privilege. First of all, Lord, being the church and providing a place, having us a place here, Lord, that we 
body of believers, this church, Lord, this assembly, um, to be able to come here, Lord. We cherish it, uh, Lord, as much so as we know how. Help us to remember in cherishing it, Lord, how much we need to pray for it, Lord, and your power on it. Thank you for what you do for us here. We're remembering the events already this morning. Uh, Lord, I pray you'd be with Brother Mike and, and, uh, and Sister Trina this morning. Uh, God, I pray for uh, every touch that will be about them, Lord, every soul, Lord, uh, that has to do with them and ministering to them and helping them and, uh, and working on them, I pray. And thank you, Lord, for the ride there, Lord, the safety there. Yep. All that's taking place already, Lord, and uh, folks trying to help them. I pray for the physicians and the support teams there. I just pray, God, you help them. And they know exactly what to do. We pray for this meeting now. Uh, thank you already for this past hours and what we've learned and heard. Thank you for the talents, God, the souls that have lended their talents to glorify you in song. And, and Lord, just lift you up and it just blesses our soul, uh, Lord, beyond words. I just thank you so much for it. We thank you, Lord, for the word as well, and the most of all. And Lord, the delivery of it, we pray for this morning. Be with your man. Uh, be with his voice. Be with, uh, Lord... Uh, his crawl, Lord, what's built up inside for him to deliver it with, I pray you'd give him that, Lord. And I pray, God, you'd help him physically to preach to us. Thank you for his help and his wife's help, God, and how you've, uh, how you've taken care of him uh, through these years. Uh, Lord, to deliver messages and for this ministry and the out outreach of it. Uh, we ask you, Lord, to help us now. Thank you for the visitors here. Uh, we pray for those that uh, would like to be here at camp, for those that are uh, listening, Lord, through the airways that you provide. We thank you for that, and I pray God a blessing on them as well. Help us to get something out of this meeting. Be with your man. Uh, may, the, may the word, Lord, as we try to pray, and uh, as we know to pray, Lord, that it may have free course and realize what, it, what must take place for it to do that. We give you the glory now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Look, if you will, in Genesis 3. Now, the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 2, he talks about the church there at Ephesus. And that church was a beehive of activity. And the church that was that involved in doing everything that they needed to do, the way it needed to be done, all of the things were technically as perfect as it could possibly be. It couldn't have been any better. If you were to look at that church from the outside, you would think without question that church has got to have God in it. But the Lord says about that church something He doesn't say about any of the other churches. He says about that church, He said, But I have somewhat against thee. He commends them for all the things they have right. But He said, I have something against you. Because thou hast left thy first love. They willingly made a decision to leave Him behind and go on and go their own way. In Genesis chapter number 3 and some of the illustrations I'm going to give you, you wouldn't think with the situation, the circumstances being as it is, you would not think that these people would have reason to leave. I mean, the church at Ephesus had everything that they could possibly have, as well as the disciples. They've seen supernatural things and miracles that have already been performed by God Himself manifest in the flesh. They've seen all that transpire, and yet you know what the Bible says? And some of them departed and followed Him no more. And the Lord turned to the twelve. You know what He said to the twelve? Are y'all leaving too? I mean, you have to pause and think if that's the 12 that have been ministered to by the Lord and have seen the miracles and they've eaten with Him and they've been with Him while He's been doing all these things that they've seen done, would you not think to yourself that those people would never leave? But you know what the Bible says at the moment of crucifixion? The Bible says, and they all left, including John, the one whom Jesus loved, who lay. they all departed. You know what that does for me when I read that stuff? It gives me chills up my spine. It makes me think, man, if I was here and I saw Jesus do all those miracles, people say, I wish I was alive during the time of Jesus. I could see the miracles, have my faith confirmed by sight. And yet you know what you see? The people that literally were with him all the time during that three and a half years, you know what he said? Are y'all going to leave too? I wonder if he were to look at us today, if he would say to us, are y'all going to leave too? I don't know why it is that the Lord would place a message like that upon my heart and it's not something that's an old, that's a, a new message. It's been preached for years. I mean, the most preached passage in the Bible, believe it or not, by individuals even that are not Bible believers, is the story of the prodigal. You say, what happened to him? He left the father's house. Right. We were in a prison one time and we got ready to go in there and they had not met Dr. Ruckman before and <coughs> we were getting ready to go in and the 
chaplain was very kind and very accommodating and told us what we could do and all that stuff and we got everything set up there and got all of our material out and things like that and he just looked at the old preacher and he said, could I just make a suggestion to you? And uh, the preacher said, sure, absolutely. And he said, well, he said, these guys that are in here, the majority of them are in here for what we call hard time. That's 15 years or more. And he said, it's maximum security. And he said, they're very familiar with the system. They're very familiar with incarceration. They've been bounced around all over the state of Florida. Many of them have been incarcerated in other states and stuff like that. And he said, if I might just make a suggestion uh, to you when it comes to your chapel service that you're fixing to do today. And he said, yes, sir. He's very kind. He said, yes, sir. What would that be? He said, preach anything you want to, but I'd suggest you don't preach the prodigal. And the preacher said, really? Well, why is that? He said, I'm not going to preach that. But he said, why is that? He said, every preacher from every denomination that comes in here, he's got, he said, these guys right here are professionals when it comes to the prodigal. He said, they've heard every sermon you could possibly heard preached every which way you could hear it preached about the prodigal and the time to come back to the house and so on and so forth. And the preacher said, well, you know, that is a literary classic. He said, it might be, but it's really boring to these guys. So... Now, what I'm here to tell you is, is that it's interesting that one of the favorite stories in the Bible is over a man that left. I don't want that to be my testimony. Amen. I remember when my dad was passing away, he was getting ready to die. We moved him from the hospital downtown and moved him over there to the hospice center. At that time, it was across from what used to be called university. I think it's Shands now, but the hospice for Methodist uh, hospitals, right, Methodist was here and right across the street there, just past uh, Jefferson Street. And so we got him up there and we got him situated and settled. And I remember my dad saying to me when I was praying there with him and talking to him, and he said, boy, he said, if I do anything crazy or I say anything hurtful to my testimony or to your mama, he said, uh, find somebody, give me some medicine and knock me out. Amen. And I said, well, daddy, I mean, you know, those things happen and the toxins build up and all the stuff they tried to explain to me and, and that kind of a deal. And he said, I'm not worried about that. He said, son, all they're going to remember is how I finish. 40-something years in the ministry, 50-something years in the ministry, not going to hold a candle if I don't go out the right way. I don't want the end of my testimony to be, I'm done, I'm through, I'm out of here, I quit, I give up. Who do you think's behind that? I guarantee you I know who's behind that. It's not the Lord behind that. That's the flesh and the devil. They've come in concert together to come up against the Lord. You say what? To try to drive you out. And you say, well, it can't happen to me, preacher. I'm independent, Bible-believing Christian. I believe in street preaching, and I believe hell's hot and heaven's sweet and all that kind of stuff. His apostles said, see you later. They, de they deserted him. Peter, the big mouth, the one that said, though all others forsake, he departed. Oh, there's some illustrations of some individuals here. Could you imagine living in a garden and everything's perfect? I mean, you think your husband's the greatest man in the world, your wife's the best woman that's ever lived and ever survived, and you have everything that you could possibly want. You don't have to worry about animals getting you, robbers breaking in on you. You don't have to worry about sickness or death or disease. There's no worry, by the way, in the garden. Nothing to worry about. Nothing to be anxious about. No concern about anything at all. The weather's absolutely perfect all the time. Something new happening every single day. And on top of that, the Lord Himself comes down in the cool of the evening every day, and He walks with Him, and He talks with Him, and He he spends time with them, and if they get the slightest little bit bored, if they could even sense what boredom was like, the Lord would pick a daisy off the ground there and paint the most beautiful sunset you've ever seen. I mean, literally, never a moment's time that they're not having something new and exciting going on. Perfect peace. And yet, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says Adam partook of that thing with Eve, and when he partook of that thing, he said, I'll see you later. And the Lord comes down to walk with him in the cool of Eve, and you know what Adam found out? He found himself in a place he never thought he'd be. You say, what happened? His wife got to him. Sure. I'm going to try to be harsh with you, and I'm not anti-woman. I'm grateful I have a good mama. She's laid up in the hospital right now. That doesn't take away from the fact that she's a good woman. I got a good wife. I appreciate that. And every one of us came from a woman. So, I mean, I, I appreciate women. But you know what? Sometimes women can be a bad influence on you. Sometimes women can get a hold of something and get you twisted up every which way for Sunday. And instead of walking with the Lord, you'd choose to walk with her and get cast out of the garden. You know what happened with Adam? Adam got afraid. Adam got scared. Adam, instead of running to the Lord when he messed up, Adam wound up hiding from the Lord. 
You know that, that Bible, what he says to you? The Lord comes down there. You'll be down there in Genesis 3 there around verses 8, 9, 10 along there. The Bible said when the Lord came down in the cool of the evening there that he's looking around. You know what he has to ask? One of the most horrible questions I find in the Bible. Where are you at, boy? Where art thou? King's English, I understand that. Why would he have to ask him that? I mean, he knows everything. But you know what? Adam finds himself in a position after being in a perfect garden with a perfect woman and everything being as perfect as it could possibly be and walking with the Lord the day before. The day before. Met a theophany, met God manifest in the flesh, walking with him, naming a rhinoceri and naming a giraffe and naming a monkey and naming a, a different animals that are there, and rabbits and squirrels and all those other kind of things, sitting and talking with the Lord, having that kind of fellowship with him. And the next day, hey Adam, where are you? Have you gone out from the presence of the Lord? Where are you, Adam? The Lord didn't ask that because He didn't know where Adam was. He wanted to know if Adam knew where he was. You say, where was he? He had gotten away from the Lord. You say, why? He didn't like the decision that was made. The decision that says, you know something, Adam, you put me in a position now that I told you in the day thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. I told you. I warned you. I cautioned you. But you chose to go ahead and do what you want to. Oh, I'd love to put the whole thing on the woman. I can't put the whole thing on the woman. You can't blame the whole thing on Eve. He had a free will to choose. He was told the same thing. Maybe he should have gone and pled in her behalf. Maybe he should have waited for the Lord to come down there and say, Lord, I find myself in a heap of trouble, man. I am in a mess, man. I don't know which way's up or down. I'm in a straight betwixt two having a desire to depart. I'm between a rock and a hard place. Lord, what's the wrong? Well, the woman that you gave me, Lord, she partook of the fruit and she wants me to partake of the fruit and I know better than to do that and I don't know. I, I, I want to stay in fellowship with you, but I sure do love her. What do you think that was like for him, ladies and gentlemen, had never experienced that kind of love before and now the love of his life is there saying, hey, why don't you go ahead? You don't want me to die by myself. Have you ever considered the emotion that was tangled up in that thing? He didn't have anything to measure it by. He hadn't been to school. He hadn't been dating other people. He didn't know anything like that. I mean, all of a sudden he's feeling all of these things that he'd never felt before and all of a sudden before he thought about making intercession for it, asking God what to do before he even thought. Yep. He ate the fruit. Yep. I don't know about you. I can't say for you, but if the Bible's right, you know what will happen? That same temptation is now. All of a sudden, emotions will take over. All of a sudden, you got to make a decision. you got to do something now. And they start putting pressure on you. And you got to do it now. And you got to do it now. And you got to do it now. And then all of a sudden, you sacrifice the permanent on the altar of the immediate. You say, why? Your emotions take over. And before long, the Lord said, where in the cat hair are you at, boy? What are you doing? You are in a perfect environment and it's nobody but me, you, and her. you got to be kidding me. You talk to me every day. Why couldn't you talk to me about that? What's wrong with you? Adam has to come. You know what he does? The Bible said, we hid. He said, why are you hiding? You read the passage. I'm kind of giving you an up-to-date thing. You know what he said? Because we were afraid. Afraid? Do you ever realize, ladies and gentlemen, how that must have made God feel? Why would you be afraid? They've never been in fear of anything at all. Never been concerned about it at all. God's always been there, met every need they ever had. Tell me what point in time, at any moment, God had ever scared them before. And now he's being accused of something. How was he able to have that fear show up? It showed up because of that uh, knowing good and evil. They never knew evil until they ate the fruit. And now they feared the wrong thing. They should have feared Him enough to run to Him, not run away from Him. Right. We were afraid, and so we hid ourselves. We didn't do a very good job, Adam. You're over there hiding. Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought that sometimes we as Christians sometimes play hide and seek with the Lord? As if He can't see us? <laughs> you ever had a little puppy before? 
you know how they go. They're cute as they can be, man, especially if they've eaten too much puppy child. They run out in the yard and then they, they fall over because their belly's got them, you know, and they just fall over in the grass. You try to stand them back up and they can't. They look like little pot-bellied pigs. But if you've ever seen them, man, they run out there and they hide down in the grass and they think because they can't see you, you can't see it. You're standing up here looking right at them. But they're down here, man, and they think because they can't see you, you know what they're thinking? They're thinking, oh, well, he can't see me. No, you're standing right there looking at him. You know what I know about Christians? I know about Christians that the Lord walks with you and He talks with you and He spends time with you. And I think there's a bunch of hidden Christians today. They're hiding in the bushes. What are you hiding from? What's the matter? What's the trouble? What's the problem? Lord, we were afraid. What were you afraid of? Well, Lord, we know we did wrong. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Cleanses from all sin. Why would you run away from that? Don't get out there where He can knock the tar out of you. Get up there close to Him. You say, yeah, but what's going to happen? My son despise not the chastened Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked to Him. For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom He received. You say, what's wrong? He didn't like the decision that was made. You know what happened? Adam gets turned out of the garden. Why did that happen? Because of Adam's decision to do what he did. There was a wrong decision. You ever broken fellowship with the Lord because of something you did and then hold Him responsible for it? You say, that didn't happen. Yeah, it did. All you have to do is read the passage. The Lord said, okay, Adam, what are you hiding for? Well, Lord, you know what His answer is? The woman you gave me. Indirectly, that's blaming God. Well, Lord, it wasn't me. It was the woman. Well, son, I gave you the right. You and I walked and talked before I ever brought her into your life. Let me just tag this for just a second, man. What if he'd have interceded for her? What if he'd have prayed for her? What if he'd have asked God to have mercy on her? You, you'd ever consider how it might have turned out? Well, I don't know, preacher. I, don't, yeah, I know you got it all figured out. But you know what he did? Instead of being what he was supposed to be and having the relationship with God he was supposed to have, you know what he said? He let the woman play God in his life for a minute. You ever let the woman play God in your life? So you don't know what you're talking about. I've been doing this a long time. I just got a phone call this week. And I was sitting up there at the hospital and a guy calling, preacher, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. It's really important. And I said, well, let me get where I can talk. And I go out in this little cubbyhole area down. And I said, okay, man, what's going on? And he began to lay some things out and stuff like that. And I said, well, what did you do? And he goes, well, you know, preacher, he goes, you know, she had to. And I said, whoa, 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 hold on, back up now. What? And he said, well, it was either leave him or leave her. What should he have done? I said, well, you probably should pray about that. I mean, I'm not in that position. But she put it to him at an ultimatum. We're going to go over here to such and such a place, and if you're not going, I'm done with you if you, go, if you set foot back in that church. Bible-believing church, I know the pastor. So, well, preacher, that never happened to me. I guarantee you, Eve never saw it coming until the day it happened. Can I just say this, that sometimes we make decisions that we shouldn't make and sometimes you know what happens? It causes us to get out of fellowship with the Lord. You don't have to be out of fellowship with the Lord. Don't go trying to cover it up with your own righteousness and all your history of all the things you've done in the past and all that. You know, all that'll matter, the fact you took the root. What do you know about Adam? How long was he there? What goods had he done? What work, good works had he done? How long had him and the Lord walked together before Eve was come along? How long had they been together as a couple before that took place? How long had they had perfect peace for that? doesn't say. You know what it says? When they ate, they're out. One of the things you got to be careful about, ladies and gentlemen, is, is that when God says something to it, He intends, He's not a respecter of person. He's going to put a period at the end of the sentence. You say, well, what should he have done, preacher? Well, I'd like to say I would do this, but what he should have done was pray on her behalf. Men, that's what you're supposed to do. Do you pray for her as much as you yell at her? And that's your job. Do you intercede for her? You say, but preacher, she's whacked out as a soup sandwich. You married her, you must be whacked out. Birds of a feather flock together. Amen. You probably need some of whatever she's taking too. <laughs> Help me a little bit. Y'all are all looking down at the carpet now. <laughs> Your job is to pray. Do you ever pray? What if she's misleading you? Do you pray? Do you set the example? Where's that line drawn? That's your job as a man, if you're a man. 
not a mouse. You've got a saw log for a backbone instead of a cotton string. You might capitulate in other things along the way. No marriage sat as a uh, mass any time at all without you giving and taking and giving and taking. I'm talking about when it comes to something spiritual, do you have the courage to follow God instead of following her? I don't know if you do or not. I couldn't tell you. You know what it cost Adam? He's out of fellowship. You know what ultimately it cost him? The next story there in Genesis chapter 4, you say, what happened? Cain slew Abel. You say, what was that? That's a direct result of Adam and Eve. And there's jealousy going on there. You say, what happened with Cain? Cain got mad because of the discipline. You ever, get, you ever see a kid, I wasn't allowed to do that. My daddy blister my hind end and wear me out good. Three swats is all you needed, man. And when you got done with that kind of a thing, he'd say, all right, dry it up or I'll give you something to cry about. He was no frills. He wasn't playing games. He wasn't joking around. But you're not going to run around with a poochy lip and pouting all the time like I've done something wrong to you, like I'm a bad father because I punished you. No, uh-uh. You did it. You got the punishment. That's on you. Take your whipping and shut your mouth. I am war slap out with these men, call themselves men, and realize they're wrong and won't take the whipping. Take your cotton picking whipping, take your medicine, and then let's get up and go on. Accept responsibility for it. I've made my decision about that stuff. You say, what happened? I believe a policeman, no offense intended, sir, I believe a policeman who should know better and who does something wrong, I believe he ought to have the full extent of the law put on it because he should have known better. He took advantage of the office. He held. I think the same thing about pastors. I think the same thing about bosses. I think the same thing about fathers. I think the same thing about businessmen. If you call yourself a Christian and you get caught with your hand in the till, uh, bless God, I believe you ought to say, I did it. I was wrong. Why don't you do what you've been telling your congregation to do? Oh, well, it's so-and-so did it and so-and-so did it and so-and-so did it. Hey, there's three fingers pointing back at you, you fool. Amen. Amen. What do you get so upset about? That's Cain's attitude. The way of Cain. Well, it's not my fault. Well, you want me to go to my brother and fix it? You want me to go to my brother and get a sacrifice? Hey, it's about pleasing the Lord. You know, well, preacher, you have to understand. Don't come to me with that. I don't understand it. And I'm not going to be compassionate about that either at all. Take your stinking licks if you're a real man. You've been running over people. Take your licks. Work out a plea deal. Mike and back, you liver lily, yellow belly, sap sucker, you. What a, what a thing. What are you, Jim Jones or something? You're, you got Ted Bundy syndrome. You're a stinking psychopath. It's all about saving your own skin and your own reputation instead of saying I was wrong. I had a guy in the box one day. He had messed with a couple of kids and it was a bad sort of a deal and we, the phone was ringing off the wall. I can't believe you've arrested this guy. I hadn't even arrested him yet. I was just waiting to hear his side of the story. And he kept jellyfishing and jellyfishing and jellyfishing. And then finally I said, uh, aren't you a preacher or a pastor? And he said, yes, I, I am. You know, I, I am. And I said, and he said, these things are very serious. And I said, well, let me just ask you a question. I said, do you ever encourage your congregation to get things right between them and God, no matter what the pain? And he... I said, well, you're not much of a preacher if you don't practice what you preach. I said, you're going to tell me that these two kids that have been in here and given these sworn statements and all, that they're bald-faced liars and you're going to put those kids through a trial and so on and so forth? I said, some preacher you are. He said, well, I wouldn't have done that. Well, you weren't sitting in the box with him. I have, I have no compassion over those people. You say, what? Because they took advantage of children. God help you if you feel like, oh, I, just, I don't think that was right to do. Well, then go join the AFL-CIO, okay? You need to go join another church is what you need to do. You say, well, why is that, preacher? You know what he did? He sang like a stinking bird. He was like, well, I did this and I did that. and Well, they're not really lying and this and that and the other. And they're ringing. And I told one lady who just went on, man, I mean a tongue like Jezebel. And after she got done, I said, ma'am, did you want to read his confession? Click. Yeah, there's sometimes, you know what happens? We wind up getting bitter with the Lord because we don't appreciate the discipline. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know what the Lord does? Sometimes the Lord has to take out the whip because you wouldn't take the first form of punishment. I'd much rather take it from a sermon than take it from a whipping. But you've gotten where you can't take a sermon anymore because you're, you're too listening to the tone anymore. You watch too much of the news anymore. You're too worried about Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and, and being popular and getting along with people and learning what's politically correct. And now all of a sudden, you're even demanding of your school teachers to make sure that when they're putting across the, le- the teaching of things, that we make sure that we don't offend anybody to the point you've crossed so many lines, there is no line anymore. There's not even any line in a pulpit anymore. It's kind of like, well, it's just kind of how do you feel? I can tell you how you feel. Terrible. You're lukewarm and God said, I'll spew you out. I don't want to have any fellowship with you. You say, why? You can't make up your mind. You say, what happened to Cain? Cain goes out there and God gave him a chance. Even after he didn't accept it, he said, why is your countenance fallen? And he said, because you didn't take what I offered you. And the Lord said, don't you know if you bring what I tell you to bring, I'll accept it just like I did your brother. You know what he said? Nothing do. And the Lord said, out! He got sent out from the presence of the Lord because that's what he wanted. He All he had to do was do right! How many times has God given you a chance to do right and say, hey, why don't you bring that which I ask you to do? Why don't you bring that pride down here? Why don't you bring that reputation down here? Why don't you bring that lying spirit down here? Why don't you bring that gossip down here? Hey, listen, I'm not asking you to bring your liquor and your cigarettes down here and your rock and roll music and your X-rated movies or R-rated or whatever rated movie. I'm not asking you to bring that down here. How about that stuff of the sins of the spirit inside? How about that worry? How about that fear? How about that anxiety? How about you getting stirred up over things and the Lord says to you, hey, why don't you just give me what I want? Give me your heart. We're no different than Cain. Lord, I'm not bringing that. I'm not going to do that. The Lord said, I, don't you know sin lieth at the door? I don't care. I can handle it. I got it. I can handle it. Okay. You say, what happened? Fugitive and a vagabond, he winds up being, and God protects him, gave him all that time graciously for him to repent. You say, when did he repent, preacher? Did he repent? He never repented. He's in hell right now. You say, why? He didn't like the Lord. How dare you discipline me? You know who my daddy is? My daddy's Adam. I mean, he was the beginning of everything. My mama's Eve, the mother of all things. I mean, how dare you? Hey, your brother's blood cries from the ground. Yeah, well, he shouldn't have crossed me. He shouldn't have got sideways with me. The Lord said, he is my friend. He's the one that brought me what I wanted. I mean, why couldn't you just do right, Cain? Because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Out! How many of you are out because the Lord's asked you time and time and time again and these kids get up here and they start singing and the Lord says God's good and you're like, yeah, well, He hadn't always been good to me. And you keep your blessed assurance glued to that pew and you wouldn't dare move except to walk out the door and go to lunch today. You say, why? Because you don't like what God asked you for. I don't know what God asked you for. have no idea. Some of you know what you need to do? You need to bring your sins of your past and you need to put them on the altar and put them under the blood and you need to quit living in it and quit worrying about it and quit worrying what everybody else thinks about it and quit worrying about how it don't make no difference. Saved by the blood, washed in the blood, clean nowadays. Somebody says something to you, kick them out. They ain't your friend no more. Stop running a popularity contest. Quit worrying about what the rest of the world thinks about it. Start learning about pleasing Him and walking with Him and having fellowship with Him and staying with Him. Stop worrying. Listen, when you left, you didn't care about what people thought. Stop worrying about what they're going to think when you come back. You didn't care when you walked out the door. You didn't care when you cursed His name. You didn't care when you went back to the world. Stop worrying when the Lord says come back. Quit worrying about what anybody thinks. Just come to the house. You say what? You let me know who it is giving you a hard time for coming home? Well, I still have skills. I'm old. But I'm very stealthy. I still got ninja pajamas. I'll get you while you are sleeping. Some of y'all worried about, you know, these fellows get stirred up in church and I don't like all that shouting and all that. I guess you don't like shouting. Let me ask you this. If shouting in church is a sin, is sleeping in church a sin? Oops, excuse me. Oh no, he didn't. Oh yes, he did. It's funny how you are. We're always comparing, well, at least I don't do that, and at least I don't do that, and at least I don't do that. Yeah, comparing themselves and measuring themselves by themselves. Paul says, you're stupid. 
up-to-date version. It says you're not wise. I'd like to ask you a question here. Have you ever realized that sometimes the Lord has to put the whip on us? And instead of us learning to just take the whipping, we gripe as if we didn't deserve it. You make your father look like when the Lord decides to take out the whip, he said, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. You say, why? It makes your father look like he's unjust in punishing you. I can't speak for you. I can say this. Look in 2 Samuel 4 if you'd like to turn. Otherwise, just sit and listen a while. I can tell you this. God's been much more merciful to me than He has been a disciplinarian. And sometimes when I start asking for the Lord to have justice on other people, the Lord said, well, should I have that same with you? Just asking. Isn't it funny how good God has been to cover things up for us at times, forgive us, and how quickly we want to expose it for everybody else? Because usually our reputation is in there somewhere. And contrary to what you may believe, I don't like to hear it. I don't care if it's a charismatic. I don't care if it's Jimmy Swaggart that fell. I'm not glad about that. You say, well, you know, preacher, you know, he's, uh, I'm not glad about that at all. You run around talking about all that kind of stuff. You say, well, it hurts the body of Christ. Well, I don't even know if he's saved. I don't even know if you're saved. I mean, just time will tell. But him running around getting drunk and running around with a prostitute has done a whole lot less damage than some of you have done with your slanderous tongue. Some of your Facebook posts. Some of your Snapchats. What's this so quiet for? Yeah, well, but preacher, you know what? I, I, I know that was wrong. I'm not condoning that. It's like, oh, let's get drunk and get a girl. You're, you're stupid if you think that. I'm saying it's done a lot less damage than a slanderous gossiping tongue. You clean people, you make me puke. You stink like dead man's bones because you learn how to do things sophisticatedly and re- with a religious aura to it. Here's a good one for you. Remember the story in 2 Samuel chapter 4 there? There's a little boy there by the name of Mephibosheth. I hadn't preached on him in a while. I would really like to preach on him. I can't, can't preach on him right now. I don't have the time. But you remember what happened with Mephibosheth? You say, why do you reckon he got out, preacher? Oh, somebody else fell. The destruction, his destruction, because somebody else was careless. Do you have any Mephibosheths in your life? Make sure nobody feels like I'm singling them out. (laughs) Did that cover everybody? You have any Mephibosheths in your life? You know, people that are crippled and they're out in Lodabar because you fell, you messed up, you ran your mouth. You said something, you took it upon yourself to do it. I know wives whose husbands won't come and husbands whose wives won't come and that kind of deal. You say, why? Mephibosheth. Somebody fell on him and broke him. You say, what happened? They had lied and said David, who had never shown anything but mercy except to his enemies, and they said, when David comes in here, you know what's going to happen because Jonathan was your daddy. And Saul was your granddaddy. You know what they're going to do to you, boy? They're going to take you out and kill you. And that nurse picks him out. They've already convinced him that David's going to be a killer. David's going to be a killer. David's going to be a killer. And they grab that boy up and take off running. And that nurse trips and falls. And she falls. And I don't know. He's crippled. She busted his spine. She broke his pelvis. I don't know what happened, but he's crippled. He's unable to walk. We know how you know because when David brings him back in there, he puts the crippled legs under the table. But nonetheless, he wasn't in the palace. You say, why? Somebody else heard him. You say, but preacher, what if I'm Mephibosheth? No, 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 no. You don't get to jump to Mephibosheth right off the bat. (laughs) What if you're the nurse? You've been given the responsibility to care for people. Some of you, it'd be good for you to go visit the NICU ward. 
be good for you to see the little infants that can't take care of themselves and them having to pay people to come up there or get volunteers to hold the babies and to pat them and that kind of thing because mama ain't nowhere to be found. Some of you need to go down and see what it's like. All these people saying they want children. There's dozens and dozens of babies waiting to be adopted. You say, why? They don't know who mama and daddy are. And in the church today, you know what there are? There are a lot of Mephibosheths. And you know what they're doing? They're looking to their nurses to help take care of them. And all their nurses telling them is, is watch out for the preacher. Watch out for Brother Sam. Watch out for fill in whoever you want to fill in. Watch out for the big barrette in the back. I mean, boy, she can be rough. Some nurse you are. I wouldn't want you tending my mama right now. You say, why? It'd be a little overbearing, wouldn't you? You've been given the responsibility. You know what the Apostle Paul said? If you want some biblical stuff on it. You know what the Apostle Paul, he said, some I'm a father and some I'm a nurse. Yep. You don't ever really appreciate a good nurse until you realize it ain't all about the medical stuff they know. Right, it's about them pulling that IV out and making sure they're wetting it along the way with a little bit of alcohol and pull it when that skin is cellophane uh, thin. It's about changing out a bedpan. It's about changing diapers. It's about helping somebody into a bathtub or into a shower and getting sopping wet while you're trying to get them cleaned up. It's about running a brush through their hair and brushing their teeth and things like that. I, I mean a nurse. You don't really appreciate a nurse until you where you can't take care of yourself and they're having to take care of you. You say what? Well, you appreciate a nurse more than a doctor. He comes, gives you a diagnosis and hands you something and they leave the hard work to the nurse. You know what he says to you? He doesn't say you're a doctor. He said you're to be a nurse. You do nurse things though, don't you? You nurse your grudge, don't you? Don't you? Don't you? You nurse your bitterness, don't you? You nurse your anger and strife and envy and debate, don't you? Don't you nurse that along? Don't you help it grow? Don't you, don't you take care of it and spend time with it and make sure that it's everything it ought to be? Hey, you know what you're fixing to do, nurse? You're fixing to hurt him, Mephibosheth. You're fixing to cripple him for the rest of his life. You don't think when you get to the judgment seat of Christ that the Lord's going to put that on you, nurse, preacher, pastor, deacon, trustee, Sunday school teacher, piano player, organist, songstress, whatever it might be, Christian, you don't think the Lord's going to call you in and say, Hey, come here, nurse! You say, what happened? Man, she took off out of there in the interest of preserving her own life and she had been down that road time and time and time again and she fell and she didn't have any injury. You know what happens? He winds up dead. What happened to her nurse? Oh, well. Que sera, sera. Those things happen. You're on your own now. I'm out of here. I got no time to clean up the mess I made, the destruction I caused... I'm out of here. There's collateral damage sometimes. And sometimes it's unintentional. But you know how you can tell the right kind of nurse? The right kind of nurse isn't in there making excuses. The right kind of nurse says, I made a mistake. How do I fix it? How do I clean it up? Send me to some in-service training. Get me where I don't make this mistake again. And they, those nurses learn from their mistakes. But you don't really care, do you? You say, what happened? Mephibosheth's sitting down there in Lodabar and no nurse to take care of him. And he's out of the palace. You say, why? You can't find one place where he did anything wrong. They just crushed him. You say, why? That's what happens to some of you nurses. You just run out without thinking. And you damage people. You have more power than you think you do. Amen. I don't intend to be too harsh with you. And like I said, if you're not guilty, then good, don't worry about it. But if the Bible's right, you know what? I'm accountable for my brothers and sisters. How I live makes a difference for the benefit of others. Those that are strong should bear the infirmities of the weak. I can, but I cannot. Why? i got to be concerned about my patience. 
You're on your own though. You enjoy your liberty, don't you? Don't want to get too legalistic. Got to be able to have the right balance. You ain't going to be much of a nurse. Oh, suck it up. Just rip it off, man. Don't worry about taking your time to find that vein. Don't, don't worry about it. Just, just keep jabbing it until you get it. Don't worry about the pain you're causing. Don't worry about it at all. Just don't, don't even worry about it. I'm, gonna, I'm asking you a question. You can only answer it. I can't answer it. He knows. You can't hide Adam. He knows. How many Mephibosheths are out there right now? Because you crushed them. And they'll never walk the same. I'm just saying, if you're a nurse, there's accountability. They go to school. Nurses get sued. Did you know that? And nurses are more apt to get into trouble than a doctor because they're the one doing the hands-on. You want to move on to something a little more positive? Here's a good one for you. You don't have to turn there. The book of Jonah is in your Bible for a reason. You say, why? Jonah went out from the presence of the Lord because he didn't like the direction that God told him to go in. It's that simple. Jonah, I have no doubt he's a good preacher. I have no doubt he's a prophet. I have no doubt that he might, didn't mind preaching at all. He just didn't want to go down to Nineveh to do it. And the Lord said, this is what I want you to do. And you know what Jonah said? I ain't going down there. I'll take a ship and go to Tarshish. <laughs> I'm not going down there. You know, it's a strange thing that the Lord lets him wind up in the whale's belly. I don't think the Lord intended for him to wind up in the whale's belly. You know what I know though? I know that oftentimes the Lord winds up giving us directions and because we don't like it, you know what we say? I'm going in the exact opposite direction. I don't want to go there. God said, go there. I don't want to go there. God ever dealt with you that way, Jonah? God ever told you that you know what you're supposed to do when it comes to church attendance, when it comes to Bible reading, when it comes to prayer? You men, some of you men, you'd charge hell with a squirt gun. You'd face a buzzsaw. You'd fade automatic machine gun fire, man. But when it comes to being spiritual enough to have the cotton-picking character to come in here three times on Sunday and once on Wednesday, you ain't got the, the, the backbone to do it. And you call yourself the leader of your house. Because you had to work all day. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. I'm just so tired. Come on, preacher. Amen. My aching back. You ain't too tired to work 16 hours a day. You ain't too tired to go play sports and go to ball games and go out and do whatever it is you want to do. Don't use that I'm too tired stuff. Listen, I don't have a problem with the ox being in the ditch. It's you keep kicking him in the ditch. And as often as he's in the ditch for some of you, you either need to find you another pathway, fill in the ditch, or shoot the ox one. <laughs> I, can't, I don't get that. I'm too tired. I'm just too tired. No, it's just let's say this. If you were going to a ball game Sunday, you ain't tired all of a sudden. Right. Come on. Come on. I had to work those ball games. You say, what they got? People come by all the time. Boy, I got to go to the ball game. I, I got to go up there, man. I'm sitting on the 50-yard line. I, I'm just so tired. I, I hope I can make it to my seat, man. <laughs> that ball game going to overtime, they sit there, blessed assurance right there on that thing. I mean, 25 degrees outside, and they're sitting there, rah, rah, re, and kick them in the knee stuff, you know. And they're sitting there, and they don't see them coming after it's over with going, I'm so tired. That just drained me out. Man, I've seen them shoveling hot dogs and popcorn and all manners of food in and following it down with horse urine and everything else and, and that kind of a deal. You know, the strangest thing to me, I never hear them griping. I had to work that stuff. I used to go downtown and work at the Coliseum back when it was called the Coliseum. It wasn't all the stuff that it is now. And they get in there and Ric Flair and Dusty and Rhodes and all them people would come in there. The zip, the zam, and the wrath, and the taz, and the bionic elbow. And those people come in the gates. Yeah, I had to pay for a ticket. Man, I'm, I'm so wore out and different things. I'm, I'm so tired. I just, I, I hope I can make it to my seat. Man, they are sitting there with enough spizzerinkum to charge a football team by themselves. 
I mean, one of them got so excited one night, he went and jumped down into the ring ropes like that stuff. And the guy, before he even thought anything, he turned around and backhanded him and that kind of thing. And then he looked like, oops, I shouldn't have done that. And Monroe gets up there and slides under the bottom ring rope, reaches down there, grabs the guy and pulls the guy out of there. And he said, sorry, you know, and he starts walking down the hall. And I'm like, he just went in the ring, man. <laughs> you say, I never heard a single one of them. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. I am so sick of hearing Christian. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Oh, my aching back. Come on now. Come on, preacher. Are you really that tired? You too tired to praise the Lord? You too tired to come to church? You ain't too tired to get up on Monday morning and go make a living, are you, Judas? You ain't too tired to go on vacation, are you, Judas? I mean, man, you talk about a world that is void of men. Hey, if you got some age on you, I'm starting to get that. I grab it. Getting old ain't for sissies. I get that. But I'm talking to you young men. Well, it's just not the same as it was when you were around and that kind of thing, preacher. People don't work like they used to work and that kind of a deal. <laughs> Why not? I'm not the gold standard. Why are you so lazy? Amen. What is it? You're, you're, when your wife comes home, does she get like give you a sweater and, and a pipe and some slippers and, and some hot cocoa? What, what is that? I don't say you have to be a gym rat. You see it in the passage. The Lord says, uh, Forsake not the assembly of yourselves together, even more so such as see the day approaching. I don't like that direction, Lord. I don't like to go turn back in the direction of church on Sunday night. We're just... I'm in the passage, right? You say, what happened? I told you, you better watch your relationship with the Lord. You say, what happened? Next thing you know, you know where you'll be? If you start missing Sunday night, you'll start missing Wednesday. Yep. Yep. And you start missing Sunday and Wednesday, you'll start missing Sunday school. And then you'll grace us on Sunday morning. Come on. That's it. You're not gracing us. You're disgracing Him. Because you make time for everything else. But preacher, I have an excuse. Good. No problem at all. Write it down on a piece of paper and give it to him when you get there. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. Some of you folks, and I, I probably am going to embarrass you, but I won't call you by name. Some of you guys call yourself men in here. I got women in here that are sick. I mean sick. Like bed-bound sick. And they're sick when they can't come to church. And they walk in with broken limbs and broken hearts and all kind of other stuff. And the men, I'm so tired. I'm just so tired, preacher. I'm so tired. Oh, my aching back. I wish I could plug you into 440 for at least a second. I got to hurry. It's getting the noontime hour. Here's a good one if you're not careful. 1 Kings 19. I'm using D's if you can't tell. 1 Kings chapter number 19. Elijah found himself out of fellowship with the Lord because he got discouraged and he got depressed. You say, why it didn't turn out how he drew it up. He did exactly what God said to do, but here's the problem. Just because you do what God says to do doesn't mean that the results will be how you think they ought to be. Right, it's your job to do what He says to do. The results belong to Him. Oh, some of you Christians could get that. But you know what happened? That preacher had been on three and a half years. He'd been over there and he took the woman's biscuit and so on and so forth. You remember? He goes up there on Mount Carmel and they have the OK Corral and showdown and boy, the fire falls and the rain begins to fall and all that. And he's thinking there's going to be a great revival and there's not a great revival. I'll say this for him. At very least, he's depressed over the right thing. Yeah. It bums me out when nobody comes to the altar. But you don't ever judge preaching by a response. Okay, okay, okay. You sure judge your bottom line by whether or not your sales figures are good, though. Amen. It bothers me when people don't get saved and I don't hear a testimony of people getting led to the Lord. He's upset because God's no longer the God that He's supposed to be, and even though a lot has showed up, 
he goes out. You know what happens? He winds up sitting under the juniper tree. That's a good place to rot. You say what? Feeling sorry for yourself. God didn't let it turn out the way you thought it ought to. Now listen, I'm, I'm not making fun of you, so don't go out of here and say that the preacher is making fun of people that have depression and that kind of a deal. It's a very real thing. I'm not making light of it. But ladies and gentlemen, i got news for you. If you don't be careful, you know what will happen? You'll find yourself sitting on your blessed assurance and you'll be curled up underneath that juniper tree and there's nobody in here that doesn't have something that's occurred in their past that would justify sitting under the juniper tree and saying, it's enough, Lord, just let me die. And there's very few of you in here that have been around for more than 35 years that haven't at times said, you know something, Lord, I think I'd be better off dead. I had a lady tell me the other day when she was going through something and she just looked up and she just said this. She said, Preacher, honestly, I believe I would just rather die. She said, what'd you do? Oh, I jumped on her with both feet and I said, Sister, bless God, how could you do that? You can do all things through Christ and all that kind of stuff. I said, I understand. You say, why? I've been there. Tired of the fight and tired of struggle and tired of putting up with different things. But can I say this to you? Because it's an important thing for you to understand. Discouragement, depression is one of those things that can put you out of fellowship with the Lord. And if you're not careful, you know where you'll be? You'll stay right there and you'll die right there. You will die under that tree. And you know what I know? If I know the Lord, the Lord comes by that tree. You know what He does? He comes by and He says, hey, you hungry? Are you thirsty? Isn't it strange how many people can utilize that, but it's they only under the juniper tree on Sunday? Fix them to get close to the curb right now. I know your juniper tree, it's the charismatic church. I know your juniper tree, it's the feel good place. I know your juniper tree, it's the golf course or the deer stand or the fishing boat or the bed. Because it's the only day you get. I know how that is. I, I understand that. Isn't it strange that, that's, that that happens? And then guess what? Monday through Saturday, you can get up and you can go and you can do and you can be a part. Isn't that strange? Don't you find that strange at all? Do you think you're fooling God with that? You can fool us. Why is it only Juniper Junction comes on Sunday? And then I'm the bad guy because I'm saying depression's not real. It is real, but why is it only on Sunday? bad enough on Sunday to keep you from doing what God said to do. Do you not think God would give you the power to do it? Oh, well, who is it that gives you the power to do everything else you need to do? Well, you can make it to the bank. You can make it to the doctor. You can make it to the restaurant. You can make get your fur done. You can get your mani-pedi. You can get your car picked up. You can take care of your animals. The church... If I'm not careful, I get a complex. You say, why? Well, I figure you're at Juniper Junction because I did something. Well, then you need to find somewhere else that would encourage you to be able to do what God tells you to do. You say, why? We're trying to keep you in. Amen. It's funny how that day's gotten to be. You remember the passage in Isaiah 58? You remember that the Lord rested on the seventh day? You want to be careful about that word rest. That doesn't mean lay on your fat butt. Pardon me. Excuse me. That don't mean lay on your oversized posterior. <laughs> and use the day of rest. I apologize and kids, that wasn't right. So just, but listen to me and use that day of rest as if you're something scriptural, something spiritual. The Lord's down there going, I'm taking roll and out of 52 weeks, you seem to find time for everything but me. I wonder why you can't get a prayer through. There's people that are justified. If you're justified, don't put the shoe on. And you're already not coming, so you're not going to come anyway. So, you know, build a bridge and get over it. But for those of you that are here thinking, you know, well, I'm just, I'm just struggling. He found a good reason. Let me just give you another one here real quick. I want to get through these if I can. You ever think about this? You ever think about what it would be like for Peter? After you've deserted and after you've denied to be able to come back? You know what Peter said? Even after he had already seen the Lord on two occasions, resurrected Lord on two occasions, 
You know what Peter said? I'm going fishing. Because in Peter's mind, what he had done disqualified him from being in the ministry. Peter figured, <laughs> I called the Lord a liar. I did exactly what he said I was going to do. I don't deserve to be in the ministry. I have to go back and do what I used to do, make a living on my own. And before long, you know what happens? You find him out there in the middle of the fishing, and boy, he is miserable. You know why? He ain't caught nothing. The Lord said, if you're the big fisherman, how come you ain't put no fish in the boat? Peter's out there fishing, and you know what will happen? You'll find yourself taking interest in other things that are not interesting to the Lord. You'll go back to the life you knew before. Back to where you're comfortable. Back to the boat you came out of. Back to the things that the Lord called you away from. Can I just say this to it? It's not always the bar. It's not always back to a needle. It's not always back to the wrong crowd. It's just anywhere other than where the Lord wants you to be. And Peter's out there fishing. And if you're not careful, you know what will happen? You'll keep fishing and you'll keep fishing and you'll keep fishing and trying to convince yourself like the prodigal that I must be in the will of God because when I first left the father's house, guess what? I was successful for a while. Success doesn't mean you're in the will of God. How do you know it's not the devil that did it? I mean, Moses could say he was pretty successful. I mean, he's out there in Midian. He's found a wife. He's got a couple of kids. He's going to inherit all the sheep and stuff like that. I mean, he's number two in charge. He's, I mean, he's doing pretty good. See, see, perception can be deceiving because you can think, oh, God must be blessing me. Not necessarily. And that prodigal winds up getting out. Now... Peter's out there in the boat. What is he doing? Well, I, I don't know how to do anything. I know how to go fishing, so I'm going fishing. You know the odd thing? Here's a tragedy. Those same men that had been following Jesus followed Peter into the fishing boat and they pulled away from the Lord. That's after they had seen him in the upper room. That's after he's appeared to Thomas. They're all in the boat with him. You know what can happen? You create a draft behind you. And before long, the leadership quality that the Lord gave you, you're leading them away from the Lord. You say, why? Well, because you're miserable. And before long, you got people out on the water doing things they have no business doing. You say, what were they doing? They weren't drinking. They weren't smoking. They weren't running around with women. They weren't doing any of that stuff. What they were doing was what they had done before. It was clean. There was nothing wrong with it. It just happened to be out of the will of God. Thank the Lord for Jesus. I'll have to stop at this when it's getting late. The Lord comes and says, hey, children, you caught anything? But can I say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? You know what happened with Peter? Peter got in his mind, I'm no longer qualified. I'm going to touch something here real quick, okay? Can you listen to me for just a second? Divorce does not disqualify you from doing something that the Lord would have you to do. That's one we'll get letters on. I don't care what it is you've done. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you can get back in and you can find something to do. The problem is, is that too many of us have gotten comfortable back out in the fishing boat. You've gone back to the old way of life, doing things the way you used to do them, and they're like a good pair of Levi's. It just fits good and it feels comfortable. It's like the guy that used to be in Green Coast Springs that used to uh, sell cars and stuff like stuff. His name was Ronnie something or another. And he would always come up there and he'd say, buying a car from us is just easy. Waters are calm. Those smells are the same. Boy, it generates where you were three and a half years ago. Man about town, I was the fisherman. And pulling in there and grabbing those nets and feeling the tug of those fishes in there. And all of a sudden, before long, you know what happens to you? You've gone out. You say, why? It went back to the old way. Why? Well, I'm no good, preacher. I messed up again. Okay. Mess up. 
fess up and get up. So, but preacher, what about the brethren? Who cares? You know what matters? That you got up. Well, preacher, what do I do? You get back in, do what you can do. You don't quit anything else. But if you're not careful, you know what will happen? The Lord will stand up there on the beach and He'll try to call you and He'll try to call you and He'll say, why don't you come on up here? I got some barley loaves and some fishes for you. Peter, I got things for you to do. What in the cat here are you doing out there catching fish? I told you to be a catcher of men. Why are you out there, Peter? Lord, I don't deserve to be with you anymore. I'm disqualified. I denied you. Who would want to betray her? I'm no better than Judas. Yeah, there's a difference in you and Judas, Peter. Judas was sorry he got caught. That's worldly sorrow. You're sorry because it broke your heart because you know you broke my heart. That's godly sorrow. That leads to repentance, Peter. Come on back to the house. Amen. You ever think about that? Surely you could find yourself in one of those scenarios. You have any more? About four more. But I won't take the time. The preacher is kind of a hard thing. Yeah, but if the Bible's right, you know what you have to recognize? If the Bible's right, the last days is full of this. If the Bible's right, in the last days, we have to guard against this. We've got to pay attention. Lest what? We'll find ourselves a castaway. You can't lose your salvation. But if you don't guard it, all I can do is tell you, if you don't watch it, you will be a statistic. Not so, Lord! Though all others forsake thee, yet will not I. Careful, Peter. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.